On the 21st of July 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men in history to step foot on the moon in what is still the most viewed televised event ever. Since then, just 10 more people, all astronauts from the USA, followed in their footsteps over the span of less than four years. Then in 1972, more than half a century ago now, humanity left and never came back. Today, tragically, only four of the 12 men to ever set foot on another celestial body are still alive. The longest time spent on the moon was just over 22 hours, and in total, the six missions were there for less than four days. The reason humanity hasn't been back is not due to lack of capacity. The technology available to take us to the moon today is, pardon the pun, light years better than what NASA had in the 1960s, and yet it's been more than 50 years since we last checked in. The real reason is obviously economics. Even with advancements in technology and a significantly richer global economy as a whole, it just doesn't make sense to go back to the moon because there's nothing there, at least at the moment, to make even that relatively short journey worth it. A mission to Mars is in a completely different league. The best laid out plans today would take two years round trip, where a mission to the moon took just over a week. It's 200 times as far and it will take 100 times as long, so it will need 100 times the supplies and there is 100 times the opportunity for something to go wrong. Controlling all of this is going to take an immense amount of resources, and ultimately there's still nothing there to make this, economically at least, worthwhile. There is a good chance that a government or a group of governments, or maybe even a private company like Elon Musk's SpaceX or Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, will make the necessary investments to get a human on Mars for the same reason that we put humans on the moon 50 years ago, bragging rights and to prove we could do it. It may even be possible to justify this. Space programs trying to be the first to do something, just so that they can say they were the first to do it, have given us amazing technologies that have provided far more value to the global economy than was ever spent chasing these goals. On top of that, it did this while coming without the terrible consequences of technologies from institutions like the military. So even if this is a waste of money, it's probably better that governments around the world waste money on aiming rockets at space than at each other's capital cities. But despite the arguments in favour of limited time feats of human ingenuity, it becomes just as difficult again to justify what a lot of people are calling for, and that's a permanent human settlement either in space or on Mars. We can commit a lot of resources to go to these places just to say that we've been there, especially now that the world has many times more resources than it did 50 years ago. But to stay there is another question entirely. To stop Mars from becoming a place that we visit a few times and then don't return to for another half century, there needs to be a long-term economic justification for a colony there, otherwise it'll be little more than a very impressive science demonstration. So, are there any ways to make permanent settlements in outer space economically viable? If so, what would they be doing? And finally, if not, what would need to change to make this happen? Given the cost of sending just about anything into space, I wonder if it will ever be a thing to offer a friend a cup of coffee when they come to visit you in your environmentally controlled home on Mars. That polite offer could end up costing tens of thousands of dollars if the beans had to come all the way from Earth. Thankfully, we aren't currently living on Mars and can get much more affordable and amazing coffee from this video sponsor, Trade. I end up drinking quite a bit of coffee while I'm up late at night writing scripts for these videos, and I don't just want some caffeine, I want to really enjoy the flavour. Trade sends you coffees from over 55 of the top roasters so you can make a better cup of coffee at home than most cafes do. Since I've started drinking it, I've felt absolutely no desire to go back to spending $5 every day at a local cafe, because mine at home is just so much better for a fraction of the price per cup. Trade values freshness and sends you beans within 48 hours of being roasted, and their matching algorithm will suggest coffees that are best suited for you based on your taste preferences. If you go to drinktrade.com slash economics explained right now, you can get a free bag with any subscription purchase, so you can wake up to a much better cup of coffee. On the most fundamental level, and from the very beginning of life on Earth, there has needed to be a reason for even the most basic organisms to move from their current environment into a new environment. Be that to gain access to new food or resources, find more living space to expand the species, or just to avoid threats that existed in their current environment. From microorganisms all the way up to modern national economies, things aren't going to establish themselves where there's no competitive advantage to doing so. Getting access to more resources is the obvious reason to venture into space. Here on Earth we have a fundamentally limited supply of resources, and that reality is at the heart of the central economic problem, which is that humans have unlimited desires but only limited resources in which to fulfil those desires. Becoming a spacefaring civilization could hypothetically, for all intents and purposes, give humanity access to unlimited resources, which would fundamentally alter the nature of economics itself. There are millions of asteroids in our solar system that are made up of trillions of dollars worth of materials, each at current market prices. 
Of course, as people will quickly point out, if we started harvesting those resources en masse, the value of those precious metals and materials would drop significantly, but that's kind of the point. If humanity had an effective abundance of everything it needed to provide people with the goods and services they demanded, then the need for a market system itself would be redundant. A market system is just a tool that economic participants use to deal with the fundamental economic problem of limited resources. It's a very effective tool, and it helps us decide what gets produced, how much gets produced, and who it gets produced for, but it's still ultimately just a tool. Now of course, there are a few problems with this idealistic projection of the future. Over a long enough time horizon, humanity could just grow to fill the constraints of this new, more plentiful supply of resources. We are already reaching the finite limits of a lot of Earth's resources, where even just 100 years ago that would be almost unfathomable. Global output, and hence global utilisation of everything, looks like this. It wasn't until the 1800s, well into the swing of the Industrial Revolution, that the world was producing $1 trillion worth of output every year. This year, the world is on track to produce over $100 trillion in output. We generate that output by harvesting resources and turning those resources into more valuable resources. This is a cumulative measure. A lot of this added value doesn't go anywhere, so if anything, this hockey stick is underselling just how fast humanity is developing. Apart from fossil fuels, which are, as far as we're aware, a uniquely earthbound resource, there are billions of times as many minerals, metals, and even commodities like water floating around just in our solar system. At our current exponential rate of growth, that would give us resource abundance for another few centuries. But that is making the assumption that the growth wouldn't increase if we got access to all of these extra resources. In reality, assuming a situation where we could economically harvest all of these materials, we would probably hit scarcity limits for something much sooner than we expected. That's also a very big assumption. Of course, the real problem with getting access to all of these materials is that by the time they're brought back here to Earth where they would actually be demanded, we would have committed thousands of times more resources than what we get in return. Getting off the planet is getting cheaper thanks to new technologies, but at the moment there are no resources worth making the journey even if they are practically infinitely abundant. That's especially true for operations on another celestial body. Bringing materials from asteroids in microgravity in a way that adds more value to the economy than it costs is already beyond our current technology for now. Getting over the challenge of escaping Earth's gravity and then descending onto something like Mars with its own gravity, only then to need to get off it again and then descend to Earth is something else entirely. This is not an economic problem that's even unique to space travel either. Even here on Earth, there are plenty of regions that are not economically prosperous because their geography makes them uncompetitive in global markets. There is an extremely strong correlation between economic underperformance and economies that are landlocked, with really the only exception to this rule being wealthy European countries that developed their local economies well before global trade became a prominent determinant of economic success. The disadvantages of being a landlocked economy are so well documented that the United Nations even has a special office to provide assistance to these countries. The reason that this is such a big disadvantage is because without direct access to the world's oceans, these countries can't use container ships to directly export their goods around the world or to supply their local economies with imports. Container ships and freighters are by far the cheapest way to transport large amounts of cargo, so countries that don't have this available to them will automatically have less competitive exports because they'll need to pay the additional cost of shipping their goods over land and then packaging it into container ships before it can make its way to customers around the world. In such a cost competitive global economy, even an additional few percent of shipping costs can make local manufacturers uncompetitive with countries that can load their goods directly onto a ship. Low cost mass manufacturing is typically the easiest industry for undeveloped economies to use in order to become a developing economy. But low cost mass manufacturing has tiny margins. If an economy imports a million dollars worth of raw materials, it might be able to export them for 1.1 million dollars after turning those raw materials into basic components or consumer goods. If the industries in a country have to pay $50,000 to ship those goods in 10 shipping containers directly from a port, they will still have a viable business. If they need to spend $150,000, which is the approximate price to transport 10 shipping containers from a landlocked country to ports in the USA, then obviously this is not a viable business. These disadvantages compound on one another, because if an economy can't develop basic industries, it won't be able to raise taxes. If it can't raise taxes, it can't build infrastructure. And if it can't build infrastructure or provide basic public services, it has no chance of competing in the global economy with countries that didn't have this problem to begin with. Now these are the very serious challenges faced by economies that are forced to use slightly more expensive shipping options. So what hope do spacebound industries have when their shipping is going to be literally millions of times more expensive? To get a kilogram worth of material from Earth to Mars at the moment costs around $2.1 million. Humanity has, at least at the time of making this video, never returned anything from Mars back to Earth, and realistically it would probably cost substantially more to make this return trip. 
The only hope the economy of such a colony would have is to produce something that is simultaneously incredibly cost dense, so shipping reflects the smallest possible portion of its final value, incredibly expensive for the same reason, and also not possible to produce here on Earth. The trillions of dollars worth of raw materials floating around in space don't fit these requirements because they are basically just commodities. Even really valuable stuff like gold or platinum is not worth it to transport from space. A kilogram of gold costs about 60,000 US dollars, which means optimistically the profit for each kilogram of gold mined in space would be negative 2,040,000 US dollars. In a lot of the more grounded works of science fiction, the thing that makes this all worthwhile is something like helium-3 or onobtanium, which does tick all three of these boxes. Unfortunately the latter is fictional and we don't have the technology to utilise helium-3 in commercial fusion reactors yet, because we don't have commercial fusion reactors yet. And even if we did, it's likely still cheaper to use alternatives produced here on Earth than mine it on the moon, which is a very popular way to justify setting up a self-funding base of operations there. So if gaining access to resources isn't going to make a space colony economically viable with current technology, there are still other reasons to venture into space, like getting more room for activities. Earth's population has increased significantly in the last century, and if you want to continue this rate of population growth, we're eventually going to need more space to put everyone. Fortunately, Space has a lot of space. I know, make sure to subscribe because you aren't going to find knowledge bombs like this anywhere else. In all seriousness though, a logical assumption is that if humanity does want to continue to grow, it's going to need to move into space if for no other reason than our planet can only handle so many of the negative externalities produced by giving people wealthier lives. As humanity has grown wealthier, it is also using more energy. A large part of our wealth today is determined by how much energy we have access to. Back just 200 years ago, it would take the average person 84 hours of work to afford the energy needed to produce one hour of artificial light. Today, it takes just 1.5 seconds. And that's both because the average person alive today makes a lot more money, but also because usable energy has become far more plentiful and far cheaper. Everything from communications to computations, heating, cooling, lighting, transportation, manufacturing, and everything else that has built the modern world as we know it today uses a lot of energy. It's that energy that has also caused problems with emissions. And while the world is getting better with utilising renewables, they too have their limitations. If the global economy was to keep growing at the rate it is today, which hopefully it will, then the entire surface of the planet would need to be covered in highly efficient solar cells to provide that much usable energy. That's also assuming that the human population doesn't grow and all other things being equal, it would be better off if it did. Global wealth and the global population provide each other with a fantastic feedback loop. As the world produces more, it can support more people. More people provides more innovation, and those innovations enable the global economy to produce more output. An easy way out of this limitation would be to expand into space where energy can be harvested on a larger scale and populations can grow unimpeded by the damage they would do to a fundamentally limited world. Now of course, nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. And theoretical physicists aren't far behind. But there is a theoretical future where this could happen, and it wouldn't even require a radical leap in technology from what we have today. Energy effectively transports itself and can be returned to Earth indefinitely by collecting sunlight and redirecting it to the surface. At the moment it's not cost effective, but the capacity to expand indefinitely is there. On the absolute most extreme end, there are very real proposals to build a Dyson Swarm using technologies that we have available today. A Dyson Swarm is a theoretical megastructure of billions of solar collectors that surround the sun collecting all of its energy. That kind of power is more than we could realistically use for anything right now. But if the relationship between energy and economic output holds true, then in the distant future such a structure could be the key to making trillions of people live lives of abundance that make us look like cavemen in comparison. On a more short term time frame, this is very close to the mission of Blue Origin that has the stated goal of providing the infrastructure that would make industry and energy collection in the space directly around Earth commercially viable. With practically unlimited access to energy, the relative cost of getting materials into space would fall, and once there, there are some benefits to operating certain industries in a microgravity environment. It's possible to imagine a factory where humans could move around huge machines by hand because they don't have to fight against gravity or friction against the ground. Imagine how easy it would be to install something like a car engine if everything was just floating about. Of course, this is just an example. The ease of manufacturing a car in microgravity would be more than outweighed by the price of getting it to and from space, but it still demonstrates a real advantage. Another major advantage is something that can only come from space. Certain manufacturing processes are exclusively possible in microgravity. The International Space Station is already working as the first ever factory in space producing an experimental type of fibre optic cable known as ZBLAN. 
Fiber optic cables are what powers the modern internet, sending signals thousands of kilometers under oceans all across the world. Except they kind of cheat because modern fibers are not good enough to send signals over such long distances because of tiny imperfections that weaken the signals over such a long length. To get around this problem, repeaters are used in modern cables that reamplify signals every 60 to 70 kilometers. These repeaters are extremely expensive and they cost a lot to operate over the entire lifespan of an undersea cable. They're also potentially weak spots that could cause the cable to break or be compromised by undersea operations to steal data, which is a very real thing. New fibers been experimentally produced in the International Space Station are so clear and perfect because of their microgravity manufacturing process that they could send signals across the world's oceans without the need for repeaters at all. This glass fibre, rather than being something that would just be extracted from space, is the closest thing humanity has at the moment to a product that could seriously tick all of these boxes. Other contenders include some pharmaceuticals and microprocessors that are also showing benefits from being manufactured in microgravity. Unfortunately, without the support of the ISS National Laboratory, it's still not viable to produce this stuff over just using regular fibre optic cables with repeaters. But as space launches get cheaper and cheaper, it could be the first of many products produced in space. As for now, major heavy industry in space is still a long way away, and we're not close to running out of energy or space on Earth. As anybody who has watched any real life lore will know, most of the world's population and industries live in a few very concentrated areas, because everywhere else is just less hospitable than the areas that we have developed. But even Antarctica and the empty quarter are practically paradise compared to space, so the global economy is not quite bumping up against these particular limits just yet. Which leaves the final and potentially most concerning motivation for making a permanent space colony commercially viable, and that's as humanity's last hope. Now this is an issue that is obviously more important than just economics, but the idea of spreading humanity beyond Earth so that the species can continue to exist even if their planet is hit by an asteroid or is enveloped in a nuclear war is a noble cause. Going back to the analogy of organisms moving into new environments, one of the most common reasons they make this leap is to avoid threats. In this scenario, humanity wouldn't be looking for bare bones industrial outposts to generate wealth for back on the planet, it would be looking for something similar to the environment we enjoy here on Earth. Gravity, breathable air, and most of the services that make life comfortable. There are two somewhat reasonable ways to achieve this. A Mars colony, or a type of space station called an O'Neill cylinder that is rotated to generate artificial gravity. These have been depicted in science fiction works like Interstellar, Elysium, and of course, who could forget, Halo. Both of these are massive projects that at the moment would take the combined effort of all of humanity to pull off. Even the most conservative estimates put the cost of establishing a city on Mars at around 10 trillion US dollars. And even then, it wouldn't be self-sustainable and would rely on regular shipments of products from Earth. It's easy to get a bit philosophical at this point and talk about the rare blessing that is the planet that we've been gifted to live on. But from the perspective of a cold-hearted economist, or rather an actuary, all this type of space colony would amount to is an insurance policy against the planet being destroyed. At the moment, with current technologies, that insurance is going to cost a lot. And there is fortunately a low probability of it being needed in the immediate future. This is all at the same time that those resources could be better allocated to making very real and very immediate threats here on Earth less of a problem. If we can continue to grow the global economy like we have been in the last two centuries, then just like paying for an hour of artificial light has gone from a significant expense to something that is completely trivial, and hopefully technology will continue to improve to make long term space colonies go from something that would consume a considerable share of the Earth's output to something that we can do in a way that actually adds value to everybody on this planet. Thanks for watching mate. Bye.